Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Liz. And uh, stay there, friends, in Colossians chapter 1. We put a banner over this year Uh, to call it Renew 2022, uh, thinking about the last couple of years that have been, uh, the word I'm using is discombobulating. And uh, while, you know, the worst of it is hopefully behind us, it's still a bit discombobulating. I say that having spent the last two weeks in isolation, and so maybe while everyone's not being discombobulated at the same time, We're all being discombobulated at different points in different ways at different times, uh, which still has the net effect of a discombobulated church. And so we've been thinking through the book of Colossians how we might renew our focus, renew our vision, renew our partnership in the gospel together. Uh, So six weeks ago, we uh, talked about this prayer from the book of Romans as kind of a banner to put over our church Thanks, Levi. That may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. As we pray that prayer as a church and want to be a people who overflow with hope, uh, where does that hope go? Where do we want it to overflow to? Well, over the last five years or so, as Mary has prayed for us already, we've been saying that our our uh, missionary posture, as it were, is towards the nations, our neighbours and the next generation. To the nations, because we know that Jesus is building a church from every tribe and people and language. He is gathering to himself people from every nation to be gathered around his throne forever. To our neighbours, because they're the people that he has placed us around or placed around us that we need to overflow with hope to by the power of the Holy Spirit, and to the next generation, which doesn't just emphasise our priority of discipling children and young people, but it also speaks to the generations to come, the people who we don't know, who haven't been born yet. One of the reasons we want to hand the gospel on to our children and to our young people is so that they can hand the gospel on and overflow with hope to people who are yet to be born. That we are not limited in our thinking, in our praying, in the ministry of the gospel in this place at this time to simply what we get out of it or what it does for us or who we want to be. But we want to have a uh, multi-generational view of what God might do by the ministry of the gospel as we overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the question then becomes, what is it that undergirds that? If we're praying that and we're, we're looking outwards to the nations, our neighbours and the next generation, what is it that will enable us to overflow with hope? 
Who do we need to be and what do we need to do in order for that to happen? And that's where we've come to the book of Colossians. To say how might what the book of Colossians teaches about Jesus, about us, about the world and everything, how might that be the foundation upon which we stand? The foundation upon which we build our church and conduct our ministry and seek to overflow with hope. What energises us in that mission? And uh, as Joss said before, you know, we're, we're still in chapter one of Colossians. And today we come to the end of the introduction, as it were, uh, where Paul has been talking about Jesus, about his greatness, and about how the greatness of Jesus and what he's done for us gives us our identity and our mission. And so, as we think about the foundations upon which the mission of our church stands or falls, we're reminded of the supremacy of Jesus, of his greatness, of the way that he is meant to be the head of his church. He is the one who is meant to energise and shape and connect us to himself and to each other forever. Um, down in Joadja in the Southern Highlands, where my mum's family's from, uh, there is this spectacular house um, by Harry Seidler, a Seidler house, uh, built upon uh, the cliff. And Harry's daughter, who's a friend of mine, told me that uh, when he finished it, he was kayaking in the river, trying to take pictures of the house and was so kind of enraptured by this house that he had created and wanting to get all the best angles that he capsized and fell in the river with his camera, taking pictures. Uh, but as you stand on that cantilevered balcony over the gully, your confidence is intrinsically placed in the soundness of that rock, isn't it? Your confidence is intrinsically placed in the kind of um, compressive strength that those rocks have to hold up that house and withstand the incredible load but also the kind of the storms and the elements that that house would be exposed to. Jesus himself gave us that engineering lesson in Matthew chapter 7 when he said, build your life upon the rock, which is his word, in order that you might survive the storms of life, but enter into the joy of his, his kingdom. And Jesus himself, as he says in Matthew 7, he is that rock, the rock upon whom we build our life and our eternity, and most certainly our church. And so as we think about what is the foundation that the mission of this church stands upon, it is the rock of Jesus. And hopefully that's a no-brainer if you've been reading Colossians 1. Because this Jesus is the one by whom and for whom all things were created. Jesus is the one who was before all things and in whom all things hold together. He is supreme over all. That Jesus is the one that we need to build our life and our church upon. Uh, the Christian life contains much joy, uh, but as even our passage says today, that joy comes in the midst of suffering and struggle. But the hope that we have in the greatness of Jesus, the hope with which we want to overflow with to the nations and to our neighbours and to the next generation. That hope is bigger and more precious than any momentary suffering that we experience in this life. And so Jesus has to be the energising centre of all that we are and all that we do, trusting in him, hoping in him, growing in him, remaining in him, contending in him, exalting him and knowing him is what we want to be all about. 
That's how we build on the rock. That's how we thrive even through storms. That's how we joyfully endure to the very end. And this introduction through chapter 1 of Colossians has shown us that it's in him that we have that permanent and eternal family identity, that we share in the supremacy of Jesus as the energising centre of all that we are and all that we do. And without him, we can do nothing. And so in this final chunk of the introduction, we have this foundation that we need to build upon, thinking about the supremacy of Jesus, the foundational ministry of the church then, verse 29, him, uh, verse 28, him we proclaim. And building on that foundation, we have that foundational unity as a church family, encouraged in heart and united in love. They're the foundations I want us to look at together. So have a look with me at verse 24 and we see the foundational ministry of proclaiming Jesus. Verse 24, Paul writes, Now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Presenting the Word of God in all its fullness to be fully mature in Christ, that's Paul's labour, that's his work, his ministry, that's what he suffers for to present the Word of God fully, that people might be fully mature in Christ. And because that struggle is wrapped up with what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing for His people, His body, the church, Paul says he is filling up in himself what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. It's a weird sentence, isn't it? How does Paul fill up in himself, what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Was Jesus' death on the cross not sufficient? Well, no, we've just read chapter 1. Jesus' death on the cross is reconciling to God all things in his flesh, right? So what what does that super confusing sentence mean? Well, it can't mean that Jesus' cross was somehow sufficient, that we have to add to it does highlight for us the close connection that Jesus has with the suffering of his people. That Paul says he is filling up in his body for the sake of, in his flesh, for the sake of Christ's body, his people. That the people of of Jesus, so connected to him as their head, means that his sufferings belong to them and their sufferings belong to him. That's why when Jesus confronts Paul on the Damascus Road, when he's killing and persecuting Christians, Jesus says to Paul, who was then Saul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Because the suffering of Jesus' people is the suffering of Jesus, their head. The body and the head are so connected that his suffering on the cross is for us, his body, and our suffering in this life is his suffering that he identifies with, that he is connected to, that he rescues from. Which is a great reminder, isn't it, that suffering doesn't separate you from Jesus. 
that suffering and struggle of the Christian life that doesn't separate you, it identifies you and connects you to Jesus. Which is why, amazingly, you can rejoice in your sufferings as you identify with Jesus, your Saviour and your Head. But Paul's struggle, his labour, his suffering is particularly focused. It's in order to preach God's Word in fullness, to present the mystery of salvation, that mystery of how is it that God will save Jew and Gentile together? How will one united and eternal people be rescued by God and one to Him forever? How will that happen? happen? All throughout the Bible and through God's dealing with His people, people asking that question, is this how God is going to do it? Is it through this person? Is, are they the promised Saviour King? And finally, in the Lord Jesus, that mystery is solved. That mystery which is made known, is disclosed, is revealed to the world. It's Jesus, the one by whom God will bring His purposes to fruition. The one through whom God will reconcile all things to Himself. And so it's through Jesus that even Gentiles like you and me and like the Colossians can share in the certain hope of glory, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, Paul is really pushing back against false teachers in this Colossian church who want to overclaim the promises of God who want to overclaim kind of the, the wealth and health prosperity gospel that says all the blessings of heaven are available to you now. And Paul wants to keep pushing back against that to say, no, the shape of the Christian life is the shape of Jesus' life. It's cross and then crown. It's the hope of sharing in His glory, but it's grace now and glory later. And so the hope of sharing in Christ's glory is that there is a glory that we can barely get our heads around that is eternal and permanent and precious, that is ours by faith and one day will be ours by sight, that is ours by promise and will one day be ours in perfection. And so he reminds the Colossian Christians that it's totally normal for them to suffer, just as he is. But we know in the Gospel that we have the hope of sharing in Christ's glory. As I was thinking about this passage, I was reminded of our brother Bruce Ritchie. Remember Bruce? It's been five years since Bruce died. Uh, And The reason that made me think of this is because Bruce understood the shape of Christian hope uh, to the extent that there's a picture of Bruce on the screen, that he had the the word hope tattooed on his knuckles. Can you see it? Can't quite see it. But he had the word hope tattooed on his knuckles. It was a picture of his life literally being a fight for hope. as he endured much turmoil and then entered into his Saviour's glory. And that's what the Apostle Paul labours for, for more and more people, for all of the Colossian church to know the fullness of that hope through the full word of God the mystery of salvation, where their hope is to be found, where the restoration of all things is to be located. And so he says in verse 28, Jesus is the one that we proclaim, therefore, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works within me. That is what it means to be a Christian church. 
to be committed to the proclamation of Jesus from the scriptures that everyone might be presented mature in him. Proclaiming the one and only Christ of the scriptures. That is what ministry is all about. That is the foundation of what it means to be his church. Christ-centred, people-driven, mission-directed, but maturity-focused, wanting to see everyone mature in Christ. A few weeks back, we talked about what Joss was talking about earlier, that we're just a very, very ordinary church. That, That is a very good thing. Because we're just like the churches that Paul wrote to and that was uh, where the gospel was bearing fruit all over the world. Just like God has done for thousands of years, he does his work in ordinary places through ordinary people who proclaim an extraordinary saviour and build their lives and their churches and their eternity on him. foundational ministry it's him we proclaim and that brings brings about foundational unity where we're encouraged in heart and united in love have a look at chapter 2 verse 1 Paul writes I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments, for though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Do you see how Paul continues to push back against those false teachers? Don't worry about the fine-sounding arguments. Don't, Don't be deceived by this promise of extra knowledge, of perfect wisdom, of a fullness that comes outside of Jesus. In Jesus is to be found the fullness of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. And so continue to proclaim Him. Continue to be encouraged in heart and united in love that you might grow to maturity in Christ. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it? That our knowledge of Jesus is enriched as we experience His love through the love of His people. Of how integral that is to growing to maturity is experiencing the love of other Christians. that we can't grow to maturity on our own. You cannot be a mature, fully formed Christian and a solo Christian at the same time. You need the love of His people that you might be knit together. There's a beautiful play on words here uh, where Paul talks about being... um, knit together in love, being united in love. Later on in chapter 2, he talks about people who reject Jesus. They can't be knit together in his body. They're, They're separated from the body. But for Jesus' people, the church, they are knit together in his body through the love that they have for one another, even as the fullness of God's word is proclaimed as they, their lives are built on the foundation of Jesus, they are knit together through the love of his people. Love and truth go hand in hand, hand in glove in the Christian church. To know the truth and to have no love, well, that's a deficient kind of knowledge. To love people divorced from the truth, well, that's a deficient love. 
Love and truth have to go together as we're knit together as Jesus' body, as we're united in him forever. Our unity in the love of Christ must be one that desires the full riches of complete understanding, a unity that is built on on Jesus' truth, a unity that is knit together through Jesus' love. Friends, this is the picture of us being built on the rock that is Jesus. In order that we might have something to overflow with to the nations and our neighbours and the next generation. And that is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And that's why we keep proclaiming Jesus from the scriptures and we seek to love each other richly and deeply, if not imperfectly. In order that we might be knit together in him and that we might overflow with that hope for his sake. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you for the greatness of the Lord Jesus and pray that we as individuals and as a church would build our lives, our ministry, our eternity on the foundation of Jesus that we might be built up into him who is our head, that we might be knit together in love with complete understanding of your will for us in him. We pray that you would give us resolve to be so committed to Jesus and to one another that we won't look elsewhere for hope, we won't look elsewhere for fullness, that we won't look elsewhere for wisdom, but in Jesus, without whom we can do nothing. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.